All right, well, integration by parts is the second major integration method and next to integration by substitution, these two are really the main methods that we will use in symbolic integration. So let's see what integration by parts does. First of all, the reminder, symbolic integration, basically we try to undo derivatives. That's all we're trying to do. We're given a function that is a derivative and we're supposed to find the original function f. Uh, most function cannot be functions cannot be obviously recognized as derivatives. That's what makes the whole thing hard. Uh, by reversing differentiation rules, we get methods to integrate symbolically. But if this process is frustrating and it can be, we should note that unlike differentiation, integration really is not cut and dried. It really is more challenging. Uh, the integration method, for example, may not give the solution right away. It won't be clear which method to use right away, at least. Uh, certainly, if we're in a presentation on integration by parts, we will use integration by parts. But later on, when you're given a function and someone says, well, find the integral, that's when you have to decide what do I use, integration by parts, integration by substitution, whatever else. Um, and uh, finally, there are even functions for which all symbolic integration methods fail, because for something like e to the negative x squared, it can be proved that the antiderivative cannot be expressed in closed form. So well, what does integration by parts do now? Integration by parts reverses the product rule, which looks like this. And uh, we can see here there are very few functions that are sums of two products that really fit this pattern. So if we just schematically reverse the product rule, we get a rule that, that is of limited to probably even no use. But we realize that products f of x times g of x do occur rather frequently. And so that is where integration by parts connects, because integration by parts says that if you've got functions f and g, so that lowercase f has an antiderivative capital F and g is differentiable, and if the integral of capital F times g prime exists, then the integral of lowercase f times g is equal to uppercase f times g minus the integral of upper, uppercase f times g prime. Now, how does this connect to the product rule? It connects to the product rule in the following way. If we put the integrals all to one side, we would have the integral of capital F times G prime plus the integral of F times G. And that's exactly the product rule for the function capital F times G. So it really is just the product rule with one term brought over. And if we want to formally prove integration by parts, well, we would take the derivative of the right hand side, and we realize that the derivative of capital F times G via the product rule is F prime times G plus F times G prime. The derivative of an antiderivative is a function itself, so we end up with a minus F times capital F times G prime here. These two cancel, and capital F prime is lowercase f, so this is F of x times G of x as we uh, claimed. So that means the theorem is true. What we really are more interested in is how we apply that theorem. And in order to apply the theorem, we would, would always want to remember that integration by parts is a process, not so much as it is a formula. So basically what we do is we choose a factor that we call f to be integrated and another factor which we call g to be differentiated. Because if we're looking at the integration by parts formula, we've got two factors. We somehow have to break up our product into two factors. The factor f doesn't occur on the right side at all. What occurs on the right side is the antiderivative, capital F, and that antiderivative occurs in all sum ends. So that's why I'm saying lowercase f is the one that's being integrated. The other one, the g, isn't differentiated all the time because the g also occurs here. But the most crucial part in integration by parts is this integral in the back, and that's where g occurs as a derivative. And so the art in integration by parts then is to make the choices of lowercase f and lowercase g in such a way that the integral of capital F times g prime ultimately is easier than the integral of lowercase f times g. And so now we've got several challenges. One of them certainly is that we need to memorize that formula and certainly memorizing it symbolically is probably a good idea. But regarding the fact that integration by parts is a process, I, I have personally found it very effective 
to think of this product here really as one function that I integrate because that's what I ultimately have to worry about and another function which I differentiate because that's what I need in that integral back here. I still have to make sure that I also write down this term but really a lot of focus will be on what will this integral look like that I still have to contend with. And uh, in order to now see this in action it's really just best to go to an example and here's where you really uh, before you start computing just have, have to think about what happens with your choices. The function integral or the integral of x sine x in this example obviously is a product. It's the product of x and sine of x. But which function do I integrate and which function do I differentiate? Say I integrate the x. Well the integral of x is one half x squared. Forget the one half. We have to copy it down but the x squared is what we ultimately have to contend with in the, in the integral. The derivative of sine x is cosine x and so the integral at the end of integration by parts would be x squared times cosine x. Well, is x squared times cosine x simpler than x sine x? No, it's not. It's, it's worse. So integrating the x and differentiating the sine of x doesn't seem to lead to success. Well, we could also differentiate the x and the derivative of x is 1. That's great because that, that is a lot less complicated than anything that involves variables. And the integral of sine x is negative cosine x. Well, we can find the integral of negative cosine x. So that should work out. So we should integrate the sine, differentiate the x. So the integral of x sine x dx is, first of all, we integrate the sine and we keep, which is gives us negative cosine of x, and we keep the other function, right? Because that function stays itself. It's only differentiated in the integral in the back. And so here the derivative of x is 1 and the antiderivative of the sine is again the negative cosine. Now you can see here that the f and g are actually flipped in the formula. The x would be the g and the sine of x would be the f. Now I actually did that deliberately for this example because we really cannot worry about the order of the factors in the product. Again, there's one function that we integrate, there's another function that we differentiate. And either function can be the first or the second in that product, and we need to have that mental flexibility to make that leap. Once we've got this, of course, now we just simplify. Here we can just rewrite this as negative x cosine x, minus, minus gives us plus, the one goes away, we get the integral of cosine x, and the integral of the cosine of x is the sine of x, so the antiderivative turns out to be negative x cosine x plus sine of x plus c. And as always, well, okay, now I, I can also push the negative sign over here. Yeah, sure, that is written a little bit nicer, but as always, we want to double check. And uh, when we double check, and sometimes you really want to just hand write that in the margin of your book, um, if you don't quite see where an integral comes from, then you might also just want to solve the integral itself in the margin of the book, but that's handwritten stuff, so I'm using handwriting font here. But let's see, take the derivative of sine x minus x cosine x. Well, that derivative of sine of x is cosine of x. The derivative of negative x cosine x is negative cosine x, or negative 1 times cosine x, minus x times the derivative of cosine x which is negative sine of x, and of course cosine minus cosine is zero, and negative negative is positive, so we end up with x sine of x, and that's exactly what it should be. Okay, next example, compute the integral of x squared e to the negative 4x. Well, we see here that we probably will need to do a substitution to deal with the exponent here, but these kinds of substitutions are actually quite simple to execute, and you typically want to execute them just as you move along. Other than that, well, let's see, if we integrate the x squared, we end up with an x cubed in that integral that remains. If we differentiate the x squared, we end up with a 2x, which, which is not quite gone yet, but it's at least simpler. So we probably should differentiate the x squared and integrate the e to the negative 4x. And for exponential functions, it really doesn't matter whether you integrate them or differentiate them for that process. The results will be different if we have to get it right, but the nice thing about exponentials is they always come back. So we can choose this, uh, this one as the function to be integrated. All right, so we got the integral of e to the negative 4x dx. 
And if you integrate e to the negative 4x, you set u equals to negative 4x, du dx is uh, negative 4, dx is du over negative 4, and you end up ultimately with negative 1 quarter e to the negative 4x. And that's indeed the antiderivative here, times that first factor, minus the antiderivative of e to negative 4x, times the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. Now, if this one here bothers you, and it may, and, and you may see something like this in a book, and it may bother you there too, the first step towards calming your nerves a little bit is to just take the derivative and realize that, yeah, the derivative of this thing really is e to the negative 4x. And then if doing these substitutions mentally is not your cup of tea, and you've seen me mess up these things a couple of times, so I, I can't really say that, yeah, we'll, we'll always do that reliably. Uh, if that really isn't your cup of tea, well, just do it on a piece of paper. It's, it's, it's not a problem. Either way, we end up, after just simplifying things a little bit, the first sum end actually stays the same, but 2 times negative 1 fourth is 1 half, and minus minus is plus, so we can pull out a 1 half. We see that the remaining integral still has an integrand that we can't integrate directly, but here's where we get back to this uh, remark that I made earlier, which is, Integration by parts is a process, not a formula. And that process has led us to something where we just simply have to solve another integral. And what would we do here? We would probably differentiate the x and integrate the exponential again. So this is then also something that is quite standard to integration by parts. Sometimes you just have to do it multiple times. What you have to make sure is that you always integrate and differentiate the same part. If I were to integrate the x and differentiate the e to the negative 4x, I end up with an equa equation that basically says 0 equals 0, but it wouldn't help. Okay, so we've got to copy down what we've got. We, of course, keep the 1 half factored out, and then here we integrate the e to the negative 4x, so we get negative 1 fourth e to the negative 4x times the function that we keep minus the integral of e to the negative 4x, which is negative 1 fourth e to the negative 4x times the derivative of x, which is 1, so I don't write that down. Uh, then we can just pull out factors, so we have to keep what we've got out front, 1 half times one, negative 1 fourth is negative 1 eighth, e to the negative 4x times x plus 1 eighth uh, from the 1 half minus minus negative 1, uh, minus minus 1 fourth, so 1 half times 1 fourth is 1 eighth, times the integral e to the negative 4x dx. We're still not done, but we know that the antiderivative of e to the negative 4x is negative 1 fourth e to the negative 4x, so again we just have to copy everything down and then negative 1 fourth times 1 eighth is negative 1 over 32 e to the negative 4x and we've got the plus c in the back. My phone rings, I'll take a quick pause. Alright, we ought to be back. Uh, the phone rang at just about the right time because we were done with the integration and so now all we can do here in terms of making this prettier is to factor out an e to the negative 4x, we get e to the negative 4x times negative 1 fourth x squared plus minus 1 half 1 eighth x minus 1 over 32. So you can see here yeah, these things do get a bit complicated. We've got the plus c in the back and now we can just double check that this really works out. The derivative of course for the plus c is 0 and this one is, is differentiated with the product rule. We get the derivative of the first, negative 4e to the negative 4x times the second, negative 1 fourth x squared minus 1 eighth x minus 1 over 32 plus the first e to the negative 4x times the derivative of the second, which is 1 half, negative 1 half x minus 1 eighth right here. And now we just multiply that out, and I didn't even do that. I claim here that this is e to the negative 4x times x squared, and that's it. Well, let's see, how does the mental arithmetic go? Negative 4 times negative 1 fourth, that's 1, so we end up with an e to the negative 4x times x squared. That's good. Negative 4 times negative 1 eighth x is 1 half x minus the other 1 half x, because remember the e to the negative 4x is common to everything. That goes away. And negative 4 times negative 1 32nd is 1 eighth, minus another one eighth, that goes away too. So yes, really that does work out. And we got the integral right. Uh, compute the integral of e to the 2t sine t dt. Well, let's see. If I integrate the exponential, I get the exponential back. If I differentiate the sine, I get a cosine. So I would end up with e to the 2t 
cosine t with constants out front, maybe, well, that doesn't look any simpler. If I go the other way, if I differentiate the exponential, I get the exponential back. If I integrate the sine, I get a cosine with signs and then constants and everything attached. So I end up with e to the 2t cosine t times certain constants. That doesn't look any better either. So this one looks as if we're basically lost, but there's a technique called, a, called the wraparound technique, which specifically uses the fact that your integrand comes back to you. So let's take a look at that. Take the integral of e to the 2t sine t dt, and I don't remember right now which one I integrated, which one I differentiated. Ah, I took the antiderivative of the e to the 2t, which is 1 half e to the 2t, uh, kept the sine minus 1 half e to the 2t, and then the derivative of the sine is the cosine, so that works out, and then of course we can pull the 1 half out, keep the other stuff the same, and now I just do the same integration again. I integrate the exponential, differentiate the cosine in this case, so that gives me 1 half e to the 2t keep the cosine, minus 1 half e to the 2t, differentiate the cosine, which gives us negative sine of t. And, uh, well, now I can just multiply everything out. Of course, I keep what's in the front, minus 1 half times 1 half is minus 1 fourth e to the 2t cosine t. And then we've got uh, minus, minus, minus. So minus 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth e to the 2t sine t is what remains under the integral. And the idea in this wraparound technique is that you now here have the same integrand on the right side as you have on the left side. And remember that integration by parts is a formula, but integration by parts is also an equation. And if an equation has the same thing on either side, I can bring those same terms over to the other side. And that's what I'm doing here, because this now tells us that 5 fourth e to the 2t sine t must be equal to 1 half e to the 2t sine t minus 1 half minus 1 fourth e to the 2t cosine t and then of course we'll have a plus c out here that we'll probably add attach at the end. Um, well I can solve that for the integral I get if I multiply by 4 fifths 4 fifths times 1 half is 2 fifths and 4 fifths times 1 fourth is 1 fifth that's the only thing that changed in this step here that gives me the antiderivative of that function and then at the end here I also attach the plus c. Now the thing about to remember about this wraparound technique is once you've made a decision to integrate a certain term then you always have to keep integrating that corresponding term just like I did here when I uh, kept integrating the e to the 2t. Otherwise you end up with an expression that basically says 0 equals 0 which is correct but which doesn't help for the problem. Okay so how do we check that? Well, you take the derivative. Here is the function from the other side. The derivative of plus c, of course, is 0. And so we just use the product rule. The derivative of e to the 2t is 2e to the 2t, so you get 4 fifths e to the 2t times that second one sine t. And uh, then we have the derivative of the sine is the cosine, so we get 2 fifths e to the 2t cosine t. That's the derivative of the first term here minus uh, derivative of e to the 2t is 2e to the 2t, so 2 fifths e to the 2t cosine t, and then the derivative of the cosine is the minus sine, so you get minus 1 fifth e to the 2t sine t, and that I claim is e to the 2t sine t. Well, we just have to collect terms here. e to the 2t sine t occurs here and here, and we get 4 fifths minus minus one-fifth, so four-fifths plus one-fifth, that's five-fifths, that's one, so that's good. And the two-fifths e to the 2t cosine t minus two-fifths e to the 2t cosine t, that goes away. So this one really is correct. Compute the integral of the arc sine of x. That doesn't look like it belongs here at all because it isn't the product, unless you look very, very carefully, because anything is always a product of itself with one. Uh, now that's another standard trick for integration by parts. If you don't have a second factor, you just artificially create it by multiplying by 1. Remember, there are two tricks in mathematics, multiplying by 1 and adding 0. And here we're multiplying by 1. Now, this time, there is no contest as to which function to integrate, which fun function to differentiate. If I already knew the integral of the arc sine, I just write it down and that's it. 
So I can't integrate the arc sine, I have to differentiate it, and I integrate the one. So I end up with x times arc sine x minus x times the derivative of the arc sine, which is 1 over square root 1 minus x squared uh, dx. And uh, well, this is now where you have to hope that some things work out. And uh, I claim that this integral here is square root 1 minus x squared, and that is indeed the case because basically we've got a substitution. We substitute u equals 1 minus x squared, and this is something that I, I definitely want you to work out with a piece of paper at this stage, um, because this is the kind of thing you also sometimes see in texts, and then you wonder, how did you get from one line to the other? Well, that's where you have to fill in a few things. You do a substitution, u equals 1 minus x squared, you get du dx being negative 2x, which means du uh, dx is negative du over 2x, well the x cancels, and uh, you end up with a 2, well as you integrate 2 times u to the negative 1 half, you end up with uh, u to the 1 half by itself, and then you back substitute and you end up with square root of 1 minus x squared here. Another direct way to double check that would also be to just take the derivative of this rather ugly square root here. When you do that you get 1 over 2 times root 1 minus x squared times negative 2x. The 2 is cancel and you get exactly this integrand here including the negative sign. But that would just be verifying that it works if you go forwards. You get good practice for a substitution problem and uh, you verify that this line is right. Okay, so that's what the integral is. Is it right? Well, we double check, we take the derivative and of course the first sum end is differentiated with the product rule, so derivative of x is 1, not written down, times arc sine x plus x times derivative of arc sine x, which is 1 over square root 1 minus x squared, plus, well, the derivative of square root 1 minus x squared is 1 half times 1 over uh, square root 1 minus x squared times negative 2x, derivative of the inside, and if you simplify that, only the arc sine survives, right? Because the 2 and the 2 here cancel. The minus gives us that we've got x times 1 over root square root 1 minus x squared minus x times x divided by root 1 minus x squared. And so that really is the arc sine x. And so we got this one done too. Okay, so if we are going to something like the integral of square root 1 minus x squared by itself, well, it's pretty much the same trick. You multiply by 1, you end up with the x being integrated, and the square root of 1 minus x squared being differentiated. So we get here 1 over 2 times square root 1 minus x squared times negative 2x, and the 2's cancel. Then we uh, simplify this a little bit, and, and the challenge here is that this integral is still ugly, but Here's where we sometimes then have to use the other trick in mathematics, which is adding zero. Note that from here to here, everything is just copied down. I just have to somehow, slash desperately, try to make this integrand something that works out a little bit better. And sometimes you just need algebraic tricks for that. So here, if I had a 1 minus x squared, I'd have a cancellation. So that is what I get by adding the plus 1. But then, of course, I also have to contend with the minus 1 to not change the problem. So this breaks up into the first term, which is copied. Then we've got minus minus, which is plus 1 over square root 1 minus x squared from here, minus 1 minus x squared over square root 1 minus x squared. And that, well, that can be resolved. Again, the first part is just copied down. The antiderivative of 1 over 1 over root 1 minus x squared is the arc sine. And 1 minus x squared divided by square root 1 minus x squared is square root 1 minus square root 1 minus x squared. And now we use this wraparound technique and we end up with 2 times square root 1 minus x, 2 times the integral square root 1 minus x squared dx being this right hand side here, x times root 1 minus x squared plus arc sine x. We get that the integral of root 1 minus x squared is 1 half x square root 1 minus x squared plus 1 half arc sine x plus c. And so here you can see that, and this is definitely a high-end example, um, 
Here's where you can see that you really have to sometimes use the integration methods, including all sorts of weird tricks like the wraparound techniques, technique in conjunction to obtain an antiderivative. Now, after something like that, it's always worth double checking. That's what we'll do here too. Take the derivative of what we've had. The derivative of the first sum and is computed with the product rule. So that's 1 half times x, the derivative of that is 1 half times the square root of 1 minus x squared minus keep the first uh, plus keep the first term times the derivative of the second term, which is 1 over 2 square root 1 minus x squared times negative 2x. That's where the negative sign comes from, and the 2's, of course, canceled. 1 half, and the derivative of the arc sign is 1 over square root 1 minus x squared. And that ends up continuing like this. We uh, combine stuff here, right? The first term stays as it is. The second term has a 1 half in common. It has a 1 over square root 1 minus x squared in common, so we keep that together. From the second term, from the third term, we get a 1. From the second term, we get a minus x squared. And of course, 1 minus x squared over square root 1 minus x squared is just uh, square root 1 minus x squared, and then 1 half plus 1 half gives us 1. So this one does work out. And if that wasn't ugly enough, and, and this one now is really just purely to, to push a little bit more this, this wraparound technique and to show that surprisingly enough there are some very, very ugly integrals that we can also solve. So this one, um, <laughs> let's just say I consider this one almost cool and unusual punishment. If I had to solve something like this in an application, I would definitely use a computer algebra system to solve it. But at the same time, it's, it's really neat to see that we can solve some really, really hard problems by hand. And so we're going to do that here too. Uh, so let's, let's get with it to get this thing done. Basically, uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to differentiate the t, and I'm going to integrate the e to the 2t times sine t, because that's an integral that, in fact, we've already solved in an earlier presentation. So you keep the keep the t here and then differentiate it in the integral and from a couple of examples back we know that the integral of e to the 2t sine t is 2 fifths e to the 2t sine t minus 1 fifth e to the 2t cosine t and then we've got the minus derivative of t is of course 1 and we just keep the integral of e to the 2t sine t, which is this 2 fifths e to the 2t sine t minus 1 fifths e to the 2t cosine t. Lots of symbols, but if we just keep track of it step by step, we will be okay. Well, that breaks up. We just multiply the t in here at the front. We get 2 fifths t e to the 2t sine t minus 1 fifth t e to the 2t cosine t. And then here we just pull out the constants. 2 fifths e to the 2t sine t dt and uh, minus minus gives us plus one fifth integral e to the 2t uh, cosine t. This integral we already know, this integral we don't, so we need to also work out the integral of e to the 2t cosine t, and that's the wraparound technique again. So we integrate the exponential and uh, differentiate the cosine, we get one half e to the 2t cosine t plus, because the derivative of cosine is the minus sign, so the minus minus is plus, and of course we have the integral of the e to the 2t still in here. Then we have to do the same thing again. We keep the stuff out front, we pull the 1 half out, we integrate e to the 2t, which gives us another 1 half e to the 2t, we keep the sine function, minus integral of e to the 2t times derivative of the sine function, which is just cosine t, so this time we actually keep a minus sign here. Then we multiply that out, we get 1 half e to the 2t cosine t copied down, 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth, e to the 2t sine t is just kept, 1 half times 1 half with a minus sign is minus 1 fourth integral e to the 2t cosine t, which is the same integrand as what we have here on the left side, which means we can push that over, we get 5 fourths e to the 2t cosine t is 1 half e to the 2t cosine t plus 1 fourth e to the 2t sine t, we multiply with 4 fifths to get that the integral of e to the 2t cosine t is uh, 4 fifths times 1 half is 2 fifths, e to the 2t cosine t, 4 fifths times 1 fourth is 1 fifth, e to the 2t sine t, 
And uh, this time I didn't stick the plus C in here. Okay, so I would probably de deduct a point from my own solution here if this was a test. But as we will see, this is only an intermediate stage. And really the plus C is best added at the end. Okay, so we had all this stuff. And now we know that, well, the front is being copied down. We have negative 2 fifths times the integral of e to the 2t sine t, which was the 2 fifths e to the 2t sine t minus 1 fifth e to the 2t cosine t. And then we have plus 1 fifth times 2 fifths e to the 2t cosine t plus 1 fifth e to the 2t sine t, which is what we had just worked out on the previous panel. And uh, if we combine that, well, then we keep the 2t 2 fifths t e to the 2 t sine t. We keep the minus 1 fifth t e to the 2 t cosine t. We've got an e to the 2 t sine t, where we've got minus 4 over 25 plus 1 over 25, so minus 3 over 25 e to the 2 t sine t. And we've got e to the 2 t cosine t, where we have 2 over 25 plus another 2 over 25, which is 4 over 25. So yes, that is what it should be. And this time I've got the plus C in there, so it's not that bad. But after all this stuff, you can really say, well, I mean, who, who cares about the plus C? And well, we, we, we just have to put it in. For something like this, definitely double check, even though the checking will also take quite a while. So the derivative of all this stuff, oh boy. Well, that will be the derivative of a product of three factors, that is something that you can work out, is that you take the derivative of the first, keep the other two, then you take the derivative of the second, keep the first and the third, and then take the derivative of the third and keep the first two. So the derivative of this is 2 fifths times the derivative of t, which is 1 e to the 2t sine t, plus 2 fifths times t times 2 e to the 2t, that gives us the 4 fifths here, times sine t, and then we also have to differentiate the sine t, so it times plus 2 fifths t e to the 2t cosine t from here. Then we get minus, and we do the same thing here. 1 fifth derivative of t is 1 e to the 2t cosine t. Uh, then we've got 1 fifth t times 2 e to the 2t cosine t, which gives us the 2 fifths t e to the 2t cosine t. And then we have to differentiate the cosine, which gives us uh, minus. 1 fifth t e to the 2 t uh, sine t. And uh, then we have minus, and now we differentiate this one here. Well, 2 times 3 over 25 is 6 over 25 e to the 2 t sine t. Product rule then says we also have to differentiate the sine, which gives us 3 over 25 e to the 2 t cosine t. And finally, we have plus this last part here, 4 over 25 times 2 e to the 2 t cosine t is 8 over 25 e to the 2 t cosine t. Um, and then we differentiate the cosine. The derivative of that is the negative sine. So we end up with minus 4 over 25 e to the 2 t sine t. And I claim, as you've seen in a couple of these things, that this is t e to the 2 t sine t. My goodness, we've got to collect a lot of terms here. Let's first concentrate on the t e to the 2t sine t, which occurs here with a 4 fifths. And it occurs here with a negative 1 fifth. But remember, this is minus minus. So 4 fifths plus 1 fifth really is 1. So we really get a t e to the 2t sine t. Let's dispense of the triple products first now t e to the 2t cosine t occurs with a 2 fifths here and occurs with a minus 2 fifths here. So t e to the 2t cosine t really goes away. Now let's take a look at e to the 2t sine t. e to the 2t sine t occurs here with a 2 fifths. And it occurs here with a negative 6 over 25. And it occurs here with a negative 4 over 25. OK, negative 6 over 25 plus negative 4 over 25 is negative 10 over 25. And that's negative 2 fifths with the plus 2 fifths here. That goes away. And finally, we have the e to the 2t cosine t, which occurs with a 1 fifth here with a minus 1 fifth. It occurs here with a minus 3 over 25. 
and it occurs here with a plus 8 over 25. Well, 8 over 25 minus 3 over 25 is 5 over 25, which is 1 fifth, and minus 1 fifth, that is 0 also. So this definitely is correct. And, and we are done with this one. Now, this, this one was horrible, okay? Uh, I, I, I'm not even sure if you'll have something this ugly on the homework, but let's just realize that, yes, we can work our way through that, and I'm also trying to model here the kind of scientific reading that you sometimes simply have to do in an, in an advanced text where people make jumps from something really complicated down to something really small. If you need more steps, go ahead and write it out. Use a page. Use two pages. Use three pages. It's, it's just math. It's just algebra. The main thing is that we get the result right. But at the same time, the more you can do this kind of thing mentally, reliably, and correctly. Now, remember, you don't want to just fake yourself out. I really did all those additions in my head. I really did keep track of all those terms. And I really made sure that everything that I had to cancel had to cancel. But if you can do that in your mind, you will have a much easier time reading advanced engineering science as well as mathematics texts. And even though this stuff is hard enough and even though this stuff is good in and of itself, that is the preparation that we are really after. With that, we deserve a break. Cheers.